Welcome everybody to the 13th lecture of digital communication course. In today's lecture, we will be talking about coherent quadrature phase shift keying. This is actually a new modulation scheme which is related to the previous modulation scheme called binary phase shift keying that we explained in the previous lecture and we talked about it. In the previous lecture, we explained what's binary phase shift keying, how to generate it, how to demodulate it, how to calculate its spit error rate, average probability, and also how to draw its power spectral density. So in today's lecture, we will do the same, but for a new type of modulation that instead of using only one basis function uses two basis functions this is this modulation is called quadrature phase shift keying in quadrature phase shift keying we have four possible symbols that we can transmit over the medium instead of having only two like the case of binary phase shift keying therefore the waveform you are transmitting now has a different expression and the waveform can be written as shown below here the your signal at a certain point of time is equal to the square root of 2e over t and as you can notice here i'm not putting eb or tb because now i have a symbol and each symbol is carrying two bits multiplied by the carrier which is cosine 2 by FCT plus phase and this phase is dependent on the symbol that you are transmitting which symbol you are found each symbol has a certain phase which is different than the phases of other constellation points and this is defined over the period from 0 to T where T is the duration of the same of one symbol i is an integer number from 1 to 4 1 2 3 4 which basically represents the constellation point e is the transmitted signal energy per symbol and t is the symbol duration now what t is the symbol duration since we have four different values that we can transmit then each symbol can carry how many bits can represents two bits yes two to bar how much equal four two to bar two then two bits this means that each symbol has two bit duration so if i ask you which modulation scheme has longer symbol duration bbsk or QBSK, QBSK, because each symbol represents two bit duration, two bits du duration. The carrier frequency, as we agreed before, must be multiple of the data rate of the simple rate of your stream. The variation in the carrier should be faster than the variation of your data, and this is equal to nc where n is constant can be 5 3 10 multiplied by 1 over t where t is the duration of the symbol 1 over symbol time is equal to symbol rate or baud rate sometimes we call it now just from I, as i told you before math is our friend whenever we need to get some insights about something we need to refer to math and use it in our explanation and use it in our intuitive interpretations so here see this everybody has a, everybody in calculus or in math courses knows that if you have if you have to find cosine a plus b how do you find that in math cosine a plus b exactly it's equal to cosine 
A multiplied by cosine B minus sine A multiplied by sine B. Can we apply the same thing on this formula, the, BP, the QPSK formula here? You have here, consider this A. Everybody with me, consider this A. And con consider this B. Can you do the same? By doing the same, we get this formula. Cosine 2i1 pi over 2 multiplied by cosine 2 pi fct. And th these are constants, square root of e, square root of 2 a over t. You cannot just outside. Minus square root of e sine 2 pi, 2i minus 1 multiplied by pi over 4. And this is multiplied by sine of the carrier, 2 pi fct. Is this clear how we obtain this? Now, as you can see, what can you see from the first term? We say that this is the first term of the waveform. And this is the second term. Why? Because there is minus between them. Minus or a plus, you consider it term. You name them. Now, the first term, what's this? Everybody can tell me what's this. This is basically basis function. This is the carrier. And we said the carrier is the basis. This is phi 1 of t, and this phi 2 of t, and what's the coefficient of this phi? It's this, cosine 2 pi minus 1 pi over 4. For different i, for different i, you get different cosine values. And this basically gives you what? Cosine something. Constant. Yes. So you have constant along phi 1 of t. And you have another constant along sine. So basically what do you get? You get something like complex number. Complex number you can find its magnitude and its phase. Which we can write. This can be written in a vector form like this. Take the coefficient of phi 1 and put it as the first term of the column and the coefficient of phi 2 as this term. So this waveform you can represent it by a vector called a spalled i. So basically the symbols then you are transmitting there are four type of messages. This the first message is for different i's when you substitute i equal 1, 2, 3, 4 at the end of the day, you get four different possible values. According to this equation, a QBSK has a two-dimensional signal constellation. Why two dimension? Because we have phi 1 and phi 2. Phi 1 is cosine, phi 1 is cosine, and phi 2 is sine. So, let's look at the mapping process in QBSK. When I, we have different values for I, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we have the input digital bits. What are the different possible digital input bits? Either you have 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. So what's the phase of QBSK signaling when you have I equal 1? Go here and substitute I equal 1. When I is equal 1, I is equal 1. 2 minus 1, 2 minus 1, 1, multiplied by pi over 2, you get pi over 4, you get this with this, you get here cosine pi over 4, yes, when you have i1, you get cosine pi over 4, and here, you get sine by over 4. Is that true? What's the, what's the angle in between cosine and sine? Both of them, they have pi over 4 when i is 1. And the phase of QBSK signal in this case is pi over 4. Actually, you can take, take the value of cosine here and take the value of cosine 
and substitute them in this formula and when you take the tan inverse of what's the angle you will find that it's pi over 4 you have uh, along x axis along phi 1 of t you have a square root of e over 2 is that true from where this came we have only square root of e but you tell me th this the first entry here corresponds to phi 1 yes and we found that the phase here when i is 1 the angle is pi over 4 what's cosine pi over 4 1 over square root of 2 1 over square root of 2 multiplied by square root of e is equal to square root of e over 2, which is this. This is along x-axis, along phi 1. And the, the, the component along y-axis, which is along phi 2 sine, is basically minus because you have here minus. So you do the same for the others and you end up getting this mapping table. When, after having this mapping table, you can draw what's called constellation diagram. If I ask you to draw the constellation diagram, you can just based on this mapping table. You tell me when it is one zero, the phase is pi over four. Here, here, based on these values, like this, that in which quadrant this is located? This. In which quadrant? Anybody knows? You have positive x, negative y. Where is it? Here, in this quadrant. Yes? You have positive x, negative y. So this first value is here. Second value, let's see the second value. You have minus, minus, minus square root of e over 2, minus, where is it? Negative, negative, it's this, yes. This corresponds to 0, 0. The second, the third group, 0, 1, you have negative in the x-axis, positive in the y-axis. This is negative in the x-axis, positive in the y-axis. It's this symbol then. Yes? The third, last one, 1, 1, you have positive in both axes, positive values in both axes. That's why you get this symbol. Is that clear? This is how you can draw the constellation diagram. This is name. You can either name it signal space diagram or constellation diagram. And sometimes we ask about it, draw the constellation diagram for the QBSK considering this rule. Or you already know what's QBSK. Of course, someone might ask me, is it wrong if I, is it wrong if I put 1, 1 here instead of 0, 1 and put 0, 1 in the first quadrant? It's fine, it's okay. But if you agree on this, you must inform the receiver that you are using this mapping table so that you don't confuse the receiver. Both of you, the transmitter and receiver, should agree on the same mapping table. Because if they don't agree, they demodulate wrongly. So the constellation diagram then can be drawn as follows. You have the basis function of phi 1 in the x-axis, phi 2 in the y-axis, and you have the constellation points S1, S2, S3, S4, and the, what the bits, the group of bits they are carrying, and the zones Z1, Z2, Z3, and also their amplitude value, the, their energy level. For example, the, the, this, for this, goes in this direction plus square root of e over 2 and in the y direction minus square root of e over 2. 
so that you can locate the exact location of your symbol. Is that clear? So if I tell you what's the distance between this and this, you can calculate it. By the chorus, you find what's this. This is two of this, and this, this is two of this, and you find the distance. And you say, if there is noise here affects the symbol, the symbol is more probable to move here or here, but it's less probable to move here. Why? Because the distance from here to here is larger from the distance from here to here. That's why we use something called a gray mapping. Since it's when you have noise, it's possible that you move to the neighboring zones here. So when you move, we rather prefer that if you make a symbol error, you make only one bit error. For example, this is the group of bits you have here in zone number four. One, one. If you make an error due to noise and go here, what's the resulting group of bits? One, zero. How many bits are different? One, only one. Because this is exactly similar to this, and only the, your error just in the first bit. If you make an error, instead of receiving your symbol in zone number four, you received it in zone number Z one. This is zone number one. So how many errors you make? You make one symbol error. Instead of receiving it here, you receive it here. But how many bit errors? Also one, because here one and here one. So when you compare one and one, there is no error. But in zone number four, you have one. In zone number one, you have zero. So you count it error. This is the beauty of making the arrangement of your constellation points located in these positions. If you change, however, you will not get optimal bit error rate or minimal bit error rate because, for example, assume you put here one one. In this case, if you make an error, no, sorry, put here zero zero if, and here one one. If you make an error due to noise, one simple error translates to two bit errors. Yes? If you put zero zero here instead of being in zone number two. That's why we consider this as an optimal mapping that gives us minimal error. Now, also, you can be required to draw the waveform, the shape of the waveform. Suppose that you have a sequence, you are given a sequence like this and tell you, draw the QBSK waveform after performing QBSK modulation. So you tell me, I know how to generate QBSK. I, I split, my data comes, I split it into two, I split it into two parts. One part go to phi one, carries by cosine, and the other part is carried by sine. Yes, phi two. Phi two is sine, phi one is cosine. The odd values here, for example, this is bit number one. You take it to phi. Bit number three, you take it to phi one. Bit number five, all the odd values. Bit number seven, you take them here to phi one. While the even bits, you take them to phi two. So phi one, at phi one, what do you have? Can you name the bits that I have with phi one? Name them. Zero, one, one, zero, true? because I take only the odd with phi one. This goes to phi one, you modulate it with phi one. Phi two, can you tell me the bits with phi two? The even, one, zero, zero, zero. Is that true? You take it to phi two. So now each each one of them looks like 
BBSK because BBSK uses only one basis function. So as if I'm telling you modulate this using BBSK, you tell me, okay, BBSK says use a, the, change the phase. You give since phi one is cosine and cosine you can draw it how how is cosine how do you draw cosine like this starts from pi over two so if it is zero then minus pi over two you start from here you go up if it is one you start from up and go down so here you have these are the bits we group them here and we here we took the odd values and we want to modulate them with cosine. When you have zero, what do you put? Minus cosine. When you have one, you put plus. When you have one, you put plus. When you have zero, you put minus cosine. So this is done for the odd values, for the odd bit values. Now, what do you do? You take the even with phi 2. What's phi 2? If phi 1 was cosine, then phi 2 is sine because they are orthogonal to each other. And this looks like PBSK2. What do you do? If you have first, you draw sine. If you have 1, the sine, the, ph the phase of sine start from 0. If you have 1, you start from 0 and you go till the end. If you have zero, what do you do if you have zero? Negative. You start from minus pi. Because this, this value is actually pi. Yes? This pi over two. Sine has maximum value at pi over two. So this is for one, this is for zero. Let's come here and apply. You have this sequence, one, zero, 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 the even bits. When, when it's one, you put plus sign, yes, plus. When it is zero, minus. When it is zero, minus. See this, this z, for this zero, this is the waveform that you, mu you must draw. This is it. Till here. Till here you stop. This zero is here. Now there is another zero. The other zero starts from here. And you stop here. These are the stopping points. And last zero from here to here. Yes? Clear? So now what should I do? You have the data along phi 1, you have the data along phi 2, now you need to multiply them, means add them to, on top of each other. When you add them, when you add this signal with this signal, you get this final waveform. And you tell me, this is the QBSK waveform that I transmit over the channel. Can you recognize that this is PBSK or Q, it's not PBSK anymore. This, I can say it's PBSK, but here it's not. So this is the QBSK. What do you do after that? You do filtering and this and that. See these jumps? We don't like these jumps. They cause some problems because they are not smooth. We will discuss about the problem that it caused and try to find a solution for it similar to your project we find a problem and they try to find a solution in the book also they they do the same they try they explain the, a technique which is the company that i assigned to you and they find a problem in it and they propose a solution for it here i will show you an example like this anyway let's proceed so this is basically qbsk now, for any modulation scheme, we are interested in studying its bit error rate or average probability. 
Now, before we study the error probability of the QBSK, I want to make it very clear for you that we have here, we need to distinguish between two different types of probability of error. We have what we call simple error, and we have bit error. Why, uh, why we differentiate them? Because the symbol is different than the bit. A symbol is a collection of bits, representing bit or more. But the bit is one bit. You just define it with a, sing with a certain duration and certain energy level. So when you have coherent QBSK, the received signal x of t is defined as x of t is equal s i of t plus w of t, where s i is the one I just explained to you before here, s i of t. It's this equation. You just put it there. And here, what's this? W of t, noise, additive white Gaussian noise. Can you escape from noise in communication? You can never escape from noise. And the duration from zero to two to t, and this t for the symbol, not for the bit. And i from one, two, three, four. Where w of t is the sample function of additive white Gaussian noise with zero mean and power spectral density of this. See, always, always I'm giving you the power spectral density because with this you can know the power. If I don't give you power spectral density, you might find it hard. So to find the error of probability, what do you do? Give me a suggestion, give me a solution. In the previous lecture, we explained how to find the error of probability for BBSK. What did we do in BBSK? We said we have two possible types of errors. These errors are basically as follows. When you send zero and receive one, this is the first type of error. And when you send one and receive zero, and what's the total error is the average. B0 multiplied by B01 plus B1 multiplied by B10. And you find what's B01, what's B10, and you put them in the equation, you find the total error of probability. For any scheme you proposed, even in the modulation scheme you are developing right now, you guys in your project, you need to find this, the error of probability of your scheme. What's the error of probability? What are the sources of your error? Yes? The, 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 now you are finding it by simulation, which is basically the bit error rate. This is basically the bit error rate. You are finding it by simulation, sending bits over the channel, calculate the number of errors, and divide over the total number of bits you transmitted. But the theory is here. The theory is by finding it using math. When you find it by math, you draw the math, and then you try to make the simulation exactly similar to the math. If your simulation result is exactly equal to the math result, then you are sure what you did in your simulator is correct. But if there is a mismatch, then this means there is something wrong. That's why when I saw your results, when you showed me your results, if intuitively, I think there is some problems. But if you want to really follow the correct way, then you need first to derive it mathematically using this way, and then plot the equation you get, better, better rate versus signal to noise ratio, and then simulate your system and see whether the simulation matches with the equation you have derived. If it matches, then what you did is perfectly true. Nobody can, even, even the reviewer of your paper, cannot say anything when he says the math matching with the simulation. Because you proved it by two different ways, you are getting the same result. And this is what we need to do. This is why we are teaching you this. You see, the material is so relevant to your project, to what you are doing, to what you are trying to develop and innovate. And this, carry, this carries on for you, with you in any company you go for any master degree or PhD or this, they ask you to do this. You cannot even 
tell the world that I invented something in you unless you make them believe in, in what you have invented. And to make them believe in that, you must show them that, look, I am deriving it mathematically and simulating it and both are giving me the same results. This means that what I did is verifiable, making sense, and confirming and confirming and validate, validating the theory. Clear? After that, you have the code. If anybody asks you, just send him the code. Some people might even buy the code from you and try to license it and this and that. But first, you need to verify. That's why we are, for example, in your project, you are still in the verifying process. You cannot say anything. You cannot write a single statement about your results until you are sure. You can be sure when you derive and you simulate and both of them agree. So it's, I know it's a little bit difficult, requires sometimes some thinking and you need to debug the code multiple times, but eventually you are bringing new information to the world. You are doing something new, exciting. Nobody has done it before you. You are the first to do it. So you must, if you say something about it, you must say it correctly. So, let's come here to QBSK. What do you do here? You have, I have one guy might tell me, look teacher, I have very smart, amazingly astonishing idea for calculating the bit error rate of a QBSK in a simple, easy, and relevant to the previous derivation we did in the previous lecture for BBSK. What's that? You told, you told us just now that QBSK looks like BBSK, but two branches. Yes? So if I apply what I learned in the previous lecture to each branch, and then you find the error for the first branch along phi1, similar to BBSK, the one I taught you in the previous lecture, and you find the error along phi2, then what's the error? What's the total error? Is the average of those. The average of those plus over two. Is that true? So then you reach to the conclusion and say, look, this, the derivation of the error probability of QBSK is not really new to us. It's basically finding the error for two different PBSK branches. So what's new here? It's super easy to solve. Yes, what do you do? You, you first, you, you define the, the observation functions you have, the observation vectors. What are the observation vectors? They are the dot product of your received signal along the basis function. What's the basis function, the first one? Phi 1 of t. What's the received signal? X of t. This is the received signal after passing through the noise. So here, this, this, basically, this, see this equation, is basically taking your x of t, multiplying it by the carrier, this is phi 1 of t, and then integrating. Is this, this is the block diagram of this equation. And I told you this whole operation is dot product. What's dot the product if they are orthogonal must be zero. But here you just you don't anything why do we call it observation function? This is the projection of the signal. Which signal? Tell me which signal? Let me see you. X X of T. Where is X of T? See the magic of communication. It's so beautiful. See, where is X of T? The, the QBSK signal that we generated, it's this. This is what we transmit. Now, when it, when it passes through noise, what you get here? Some noise on top of it. Yes? Yes? This is the, based on the noise value and the power of your signal. And then you take this and multiply it by phi 1 of t, the first basis function, or phi 2 of t. When you integrate along phi 1, you take the part of the signal here that's aligning in the direction of phi 1 of t. 
anything that's orthogonal to phi 1 of t, which is this basically, phi 2 of t, gets eliminated, goes to zero. So basically, you are getting this branch then. When you, when you integrate, when you take the dot product, the thing that I just showed you in the previous slide, when you take this, integration of x of t along phi, phi 1 of t, it's this, you are taking this branch with the noise. Because this, this branch will get cancelled. Why? Because this is phi 2, and phi 2 is orthogonal to phi 1. So when you integrate, when you do the dot product, since it's orthogonal, it goes to zero. This branch, whole branch, zero. You are left alone with this branch. This is the meaning of this equation. Imagine how much deep we got into it and how to understand it and analyze it. Now, what's this? X of t, I know x of t, what's x of t is the signal that I transmitted and at the end of the day, after you do the calculation and derive, obtain the final results, you get that x1 is equal to the square root of e cosine 2 pi minus 1 pi over 4 plus noise. This is basically the value of your constellation point. And it can be plus or minus square root of e over 2. Yes, it's the actually the distance from the origin in the constellation point. Clear? Now, is that enough? Not enough, because I have another basis function, which is phi 2. You need to take the observation along phi 2. How do you take the observation? Dot product operation of your received signal along phi 2 to get to get the signal in the direction of phi 2 and cancel all the signals that are orthogonal to phi 2. Then you get your final result to be square root of e sine 2 by minus 1 by over 4 plus the noise. And this basically gives you this final result x2. So basically the same result as the previous one because they have the same distances. If the received signal point associated with the observation vector x falls inside region z1, the receiver decides that s1 of, two, s1 of t was transmitted, and so on and so forth. What does this say? If your x of t, let me go here. If your x of t, the, the symbol you received, is here, is in this zone, here, x of t, you received it at this point. So what was the bits that you transmitted? Can you tell me? 1-1. One, one. If it is here, if after you, then it's 0-1, and so on and so forth. So basically, you have boundaries. You define the boundaries, 0 in the, along y-axis, 0 along x-axis. Anything in quarter 1 is the, these bits. Anything in quarter two, these bits. Quarter three, these bits. Because you have the mapping table. The mapping table that we were discussing just before the lecture. Here, the mapping table just for possible cases, but for your case, the new modulation scheme you are developing, the mapping table has 32 cases. You see the similarities? There is some similarities, but yours is different because you are proposing a new one. So, by understanding this carefully, you can apply the knowledge you learn here and just apply it there. But you get different results there, in different area, in different domain. Here we are talking about size of single input, single output. Yours is different. So. The same rule is applied for S3 of T and S4 of T, as I just explained. We, now, here is the more detailed explanation about how to find the error of probability of a QBSK. It says that we can treat QBSK as the combination of two independent PBSK. I just explained to you why. Over the interval T equal to TB, because the duration of the symbol in QPSK is equal to the duration of two bits, yes? 
since the first bit is transmitted by phi 1 and the second bit is transmitted by phi 2, the probability of error for each channel, for each, for each base, is given by this. Now tell me, if I give you this in the exam and tell you true or false, this is the bit error rate probability for QBSK. True or false, this is the bit error rate probability of QBSK. False, this is the symbol probability because we use T, not TB. Yes, this is different than. What's the difference? This two. This is symbol. See, the, the, the symbol is similar to this, and you have two here. However, if a symbol is to be received correctly, then both bits, the first and second, odd and even, must be received correctly. Is that true? Hence, the average probability of correct decision, if you were to make correct bit decision. So, what's it? It's basically the probability you make correct decision for the first bit which we call it odd and multiplied by the probability of making correct decision for the even. What's the probability of making correct decision? It's 1 minus the error. What's the error? It's the one I found right now. And what's PE for even? Also 1 minus P prime. So this becomes 1 minus P prime all square this is you already found this where did you found it here you just substitute it here you find that this is the final answer this is this is the bit error rate yes is that different than this it's different there is no harm the probability of errors, the probability of errors per bit. So, so this is the probability of error for, no, not one bit, for one symbol. One symbol. Till now we are talking about symbol. Now, now for bits, since each symbol of QBSK consists of two bits, we have the energy of one symbol equal to the energy of two bits, and then the error per symbol is equal to this. The error per symbol is equal to this value. The above probability is error probability per symbol. True. Now, when you use gray coding, the average probability of error per bit reduces to this which is exactly equal to the BBSK. Now here question, how come the bit error rate probability of a QBSK is exactly equal to the BBSK? Aren't they different? They are different in the structure, different in the equations and this, and QBSK sends more bits per symbol. But how come they have the same bit error rate? Anybody has an answer, convincing answer for this? By math, this is by math, we found that it's the same, but intuitively. Can you explain why? No, you can't tell me like since QBSK is basically QBSK is basically nothing but BBSK orthogonal to each other one stream in the x-axis and another stream in the y-axis are they interfering are they causing interference to each other no orthogonal then when you calculate the error here you find the error of bit error rate when you calculate the error here, you find the error of binary BBSK. 
the average is also binary BBSK because they are orthogonal. And uh, you came up, you came up with a new sinusoidal function that's orthogonal to the first, not interfering with it whatsoever, and thus the error probability doesn't change. This is the explanation. However, if you bring any constellation points more here in between, this this vector is not orthogonal to any of these. Since it's not orthogonal, you will have lower bit error rate, bad, different bit error rate. But is it clear for QBSKY? I think it's clear because they are orthogonal by math. We can, as a summary to wrap up, we can state that a coherent QBSK system, that this is very important, achieves the same average probability of pit error as a coherent phase shift keying system for the same bit rate and the same EB over E0. What's EB over E0? Signal to noise ratio. But uses only half the channel bandwidth, which is really good. You, you send the same bit error rate, same bit error rate, same bit rate, same power, but you use half the bandwidth. Which one is better then? If you want to say, if you want to save your bandwidth and transmit more data, to use a QBSK or BBSK? QBSK, but what? You must use two orthogonal functions, two orthogonal basis function, Q, I and the Q, phi one and phi two. One take care of the odd, one take care of the even. So you achieve this benefit of using, saving half the bandwidth, but at the expense of what? increasing the complexity of your system because you have now two branches they have to be synchronized two carriers sending your data yeah must be very coherent now just move to the generation we already explained these things but just to make it very clear how to generate qbsk you take your binary sequence you use polar non-return to zero level encoding, and then you demultiplex them to odd and even. You multiply the odd by phi one of t, which is cosine, and multiply the even by phi two of t, which is sine, and then you sum them. You sum them up to send over the channel. So here the result of QBSK. We already explained this by math, by diagrams, by this. Yes, this is just block diagram. At the receiver, when you receive the QBSK signal, what do you do? Yes, you take, this is your signal, you multiply it by phi 1 of t and integrate over the duration of the symbol, and I call this dot product operation, everybody with me, this dot product operation along phi 1, and then you have decision plot device with a threshold equal 0 to see whether it's greater than 0 or less than 0, and here you have phi 2 of t, you integrate along one simple duration, decision device, as if this branch PBSK, yes? And this branch PBSK, the detection of PBSK. So it's really two PBSKs. And here at the transmitter, this is PBSK. And here another PBSK. And at the end, you sum them. And here you multiplex them with each other to get the final sequence that you transmitted. See, I was telling you, this is the estimated binary sequence. This should be exactly like this, if you are simulating correctly. This, the output here, should be same as this. This is what I mean by checking the output and compare it with the input. If you are doing things correctly, each thing, all the things after in the receiver must be similar to the things before in the transmitter. So also you can draw the power spectral density of a QBSK and since we know now that QBSK saves half of the bandwidth, then it should be shrinker. It should be using half the bandwidth that BBSK is using. Where is BBSK? 
PBSK, this guy that we found in last lecture, and this is the bandwidth it uses. Where is our the new modulation schemes of QBSK? It's this. As you can see, here almost 0.4, here 0.8, which means QBSK uses half the bandwidth of PBSK, which is really very good and very nice. Why? What's due to what? Due to using orthogonal bases. You put them on top of each other. They are overlapping. They are. They seem to. They seem to interfere with each other, but they are not interfering because they are orthogonal. That's why we love orthogonality. That's why we love to bring a new basis function. If you can bring another orthogonal function on top of sine and cosine, you can even save more bandwidth. You, your function becomes here. And I told you, each fraction here is $5 million. Each fraction you save here, $5 million. Each fraction, the company is willing to pay you per month $10,000 if you bring, because this will save them billions of dollars. So your, your, your trick here, your, if you understand things properly, it, what, what, is to bring another function, if you can, that's orthogonal to sine and cosine, and do similar QBSK's improvement on PBSK. Can you bring a new improvement in QBSK that makes this more efficient? Without interference, they are overlapping, they are on top of each other, the signals, but not interfering, so you maintain the same bit error rate, same data rate, same power, but you save more bandwidth. This is the beauty of these modulation schemes. Any improvement in any performance metrics, BB, bit error rate or bit rate or power or BBS or bandwidth, any improvement in any of these is super, is fantastic. We like it, we love it, we buy it, and we use it. But usually you achieve this at the expense of something, or sometimes there is trade-off between these things. You cannot perform well in all the performance metrics. For example, you achieve good bit error rate at the expense of decreasing your bit rate, or you achieve good uh, bandwidth saving at the expense of increasing your complexity. So there is a trade-off. The trade-off is coming from your invention, from the thing you are introducing as a new novel solution in your system. Otherwise, if you are not introducing anything, then there will be no trade-off whatsoever. So with this, we conclude our lecture. And thank you very much for your attention. And meet you in the next lecture.